This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the Author You, Your Guide to Book Publishing podcast. Throughout it, I, and when I have a fabulous guest like I do today, we will share ahas, insights, and tips to enhance and support your book, as well as your book publishing journey. My goal is always to support you and your book success. So, just a reminder, if you're on Twitter, do connect with me on at my book shepherd. And if on Facebook, hey, why not join my book publishing group to share your news or ask questions? And you can always email me directly at Judith at Bryles.com. Daily, I do post throughout all my social media platforms a favorite quote from my book, Snappy, Sassy, Salty Success for Authors and Writers. And today, my quote is this. Writers should start on their books before they're ready. Otherwise, they can spend their time getting ready in perpetuity, which is the perfect thing to look at as we go forward on today's show, because with me, I have the fabulous, legacy, legendary (laughs) Dorothy Wilhelm. She, 1998, we're going back a few years, you know, just a few, like in 24, um, the yearbook of experts um, and authorities and spokespersons identified her as an expert on sex after 50. Hmm. Now, now Dorothy will tell you that would be a surprise. There it was on page, right smack on page 24 years ago, page 159, right after sex addiction and right before sex and love, was the fabulous Dorothy Wilhelm. Now, she says she's pretty sure her kids would be surprised that she was an expert in this, but I'll tell you what she is a true expert in. That's research, doing research. So when you're starting to get ready for the book, one of the most important things I'm going to tell you is you get the research, the initial research done. Don't keep going as you're writing because you know what's going to happen. You'll never get going and finish your book. Put it on hold and just start writing. So with that, Dorothy is the author of The True Tales of Puget Sound. And one of the things that she found and it's enjoying its fifth printing is that what the historical societies tell you is often not true. <laughs> and, and with that said, Dorothy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I am so glad to be thought fabulous. I am also. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's so funny, you know, go, looking back, 1998, that's, as you said, 24 years ago, mm-hmm. I was yeah. already old in the business by then. Maybe I don't need to do research at all. Maybe I was just <laughs> there. <laughs> but you know, but, but you, one, but you know one why it's so of, important to do research, Dorothy, is because it keeps your brain noodling. And your brain is, going. I think that's one of the. To, go ahead. I, one of the most important things I found when I did the keynote one time um, in Long Beach, California, many years ago, uh, for the caregivers of Alzheimer's patients. And if you want to talk about heroes, oh my God, these people walk on water. They walk on water. But one of the things they learned, and I was talking about my book at the time called The Confidence Factor. Um, and that the fourth, my fourth point in that book is you must keep on learning. And one of the docs came up to me afterwards and he said, if people put aside the learning factor, i.e. what we're talking about today, research, they open the window for things like, uh, you know, uh, Alzheimer's to just roar through. You have to keep learning. So let me throw it back to you. 
Yes, not only I really I really agree with that. That takes away the fun of it. But the fact is, it, people people say, well, I keep learning like I do crosswords and things. I know that's good, and I don't want to take away from that. But aside from the fact that if you write a book, you get notoriety and get to be on on Judith Bryles' show and all that. <laughs> the fact maybe the, maybe the fact, maybe if maybe. your book is primarily nonfiction, <laughs> we don't we don't want to give them hope that they you know, wouldn't have otherwise. But but the fact is, that's the kind of thing that actually does keep you going and excited about living. That there, here, here is a truism I, I'm about to create. There is nothing to keep you more excited about life than realizing that after all, we're all in this together. If you go back 50 years or 100 years or 200 years, those were all real people doing real things. And many of them, Ah, heck, we're no brighter. <laughs> we we haven't learned anything. <laughs> and yet, for a writer, there is nothing more inspiring than than feeling that that companionship, that fellow feeling with someone from another time who is actually speaking to you. Oh, absolutely. I I think that when you look at that, even even that stuff you wrote a long time ago and you review it that you it could trigger an aha thing oh maybe there's more to it or it could be a deja vu maybe something you wrote and it has come full circle and you need to dive into it again to do an update stroke it and a little yet bit. i think so mo- I love that. most or many writers even nonfiction writers do not realize the importance we do uh, on on my you know i've been i've been on the air continuously broadcasting not just standing outside uh since 1983 and it is amazing how many people come with a story or a book or an idea and you ask them a question, what happened next? They'll tell you this is a fact, like, you know, the wagon train came out to the Northwest in 1853. Okay, well, what happened next? Or what were the people wearing? Or what did they eat? Or they don't know. They've got this one fact, and it's never occurred to them to say, well, yeah, how did that happen? What next? What more? Where did we, you know, where did this all come from? And that's where the story and that's where the information is. The fact that everybody knows, we get no credit for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, and that's really true. So brand yourself. Well, here, you know, one of the things I tell all my author clients or anyone who's in any coaching uh, class I do, Dorothy, is make sure that you add to everything that you put out there. I, I don't care if it's a piece of paper that has a blank on it and maybe a couple of words um, that you're going to have them fill in while you're presenting somewhere mm-hmm. is that you create a cheat sheet of some sort, but you put your copyright, you know, copyright like for the, the airing of this for show is 2022. So it'd be copyright 2022 Judith Bryles, or I mean, whatever your name is. I mean, if you want to give me the copyright, no. thank you. But um, I do want you to claim it and, and and include your website so you are traceable and people can find you um, and keep your toe in the water for claims. You're absolutely right about that. Of course, you're always absolutely right. I would not be the one to say you weren't, in, even in any case. But no, <laughs> and see, these are the little things, don't you think, of course, that these are the things that set you apart. And really, I think this is where success comes from. It's the little things, the big things that anybody can do, and frankly, everybody has done. You've got to look back and say, well, is this something new, or can anybody pick this up any place? If they can, yeah, I sure, sure as heck would edit it because you haven't got anything else. And, but as soon as you start adding facts or ideas that nobody else has found, you've got mm-hmm. something. So... That's that's what I think about that. But now, as research goes, I was not always a great researcher. Uh, I, I, by the nature of things, those of us who are time travelers, and I dare say you are too, who come yeah. from the other time, uh, we're, we're researchers by nature. We, I, 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 I had just told my kids that when we were young and dating, when I was young and dating, um, my uh, my husband and I t- 
to my husband to be, and I went on a picnic. And we went to a, a spot in Spokane, Washington, which is still beautiful and still close to my heart. And he grilled a steak for us, and the steak was horse meat. And I just thought he couldn't cook. And people people don't realize that in those days after World War II, you couldn't get beef. And mm-hmm. you couldn't, you if you could get it, it was incredibly expensive. So young students out on a date, were indeed, it was sold in the supermarkets and you could easily get it. And that was what poor what poor people were eating. Now that's something most people don't know and that's the kind of, um, kind of story, even if you're not writing nonfiction, a detail like that will bring a story to life. Because mm. they, this you young know, couple may when, never speak again. <laughs> when you tell, <laughs> we, have about, we have about a minute and a half to our first break, but you know, when you tell me that story, here's what flashes in my head. There was a movie that was made about the Ford Etzel years ago, and um, Jeff Bridges, I think, was in it, and he was trying to convince all these, all these uh, uh, automotive gurus uh, to get behind um, safety and seat belts during it, because they were, I think, maybe, it, maybe it was the first car that had that kind of thing and you know what he served him this is your horse meat what he served him was incredibly over this lunch blood red dripping steaks oh that was well uh, but see again Uh, here's what research would tell you because beef had see it almost comes comes into the same thing beef hadn't been available that looked yeah, pretty yeah. good when you hadn't had it in a while. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, with me today is Dorothy Willem. She is the author of a fabulous book. I mean, if you love a good read, I'm going to encourage you to get The True Tales of Puget Sound. But what we're doing is Dorothy, Dorothy is a journalist and an ACE researcher. We're going to get back to, and she's going to, we're going to kick off the next section with facts you need to know um, when you are trying to gather facts. We'll be right back. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Is there a book in you? Or another? Author You shows you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being hoodwinked. If you already have a book out... You will find a supportive and brainstorming community that is connected and creative, no matter where you live. Author U brings in national experts for its book camps and annual Author U extravaganza. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author U's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publishing. Author U is the premier authoring resource in the country, creating community, education, guidance, vision, and success for the serious author. If you want to create a book that has pizzazz, punch, and panache, Author U is for you. Timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted on its social media platforms, and it is free. Discover Author U, where authors go to become seriously successful. Join Author You today at authoru.org. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, with me is Dorothy Wilhelm. And we're talking about research. So the question to Dorothy is this. 
How do you know when you've got all the facts, Dorothy? How do you know? Well, the fact is, that's the first one. It's hard to know. And while I'm delighted to be introduced as a researcher, in fact, fact is I'm a, a humorist. Um, my other books are all are all humor. And why? <laughs> well, I think so. Um, the the reason this is important, in a way is that people tend to think, well, a researcher, that's dry, and I wouldn't know anything about that, and I wouldn't want to do it. But what actually happened was I I had been on TV for uh, 40 years, and my show went off the air, and I took it badly. But it had been a, uh, it was was a historical show, and we had gone on location to uh, many small towns in Washington, and I had been told historical stories. When the show went off the air, and I became hysterical rather than historical, historical, I realized, well, I've got these stories, so I, I sold them to a publisher. Well, now, remember, I am a person that knows nothing about research, and but when I went to start looking into the, uh, the stories for this book, I found that none of them were true. And mm. every one mm. of them, mm. it, 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 was, it was, this was very upsetting because I had a contract, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but what what I found was so it, so the book what I did was uh, every chapter starts with this is the story I was told this is what really happened and so but but it's a great premise for anybody who is doing research and hasn't a clue where to start so mm-hmm. my first question our first question was how do you know and I've, you've got all the facts my dear you don't know. And you, the, finding all the facts is virtually impossible because they, once you get started, they will continue to turn up. But where do you start from? Um, one of the stories in the book, for instance, you've got to keep asking questions. Most of us Americans are not good about asking questions. I don't know about other people. But we, if somebody tells us something and we say, oh, and sit down. Okay. Um, geez, that doesn't sound like us. Um, anyway, what you, what you do is you start out with your basic story and say to yourself, now I know these are not the facts. These are more a basic idea. Let's say a very famous story in the Northwest and in my book is the story of Mrs. Mayen's tablecloth. And uh, in, and I, I found her story in a historical, remember, historical museums are not necessarily reliable uh, places. That, but her tablecloth is in a museum here in the area, and with some china. Um, and the tablecloth is not only interesting because it's still there, but because there are a lot of strips torn out of it. And so the story that went with the tablecloth was was that Mrs. Mayen, who was a settler in our area at the end of the Oregon Trail. Everybody lived at the end of the Oregon Trail, by the way. As a researcher, you'll find that. There's nobody that didn't live at the end of the, or- of the Oregon is there, Trail. Is it- <laughs> she, 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 lived, she lived there. It was pretty crowded. Um, and whenever she heard that a new wagon train was coming across the Natchez Cut, she would go up and actually meet the train and bring the ladies to her home she would give them an opportunity to bathe, and you can only imagine, and then give them a good dinner. And the, see, so that part was very easy to research because uh, it's it's in uh, John uh, Muir's diaries. He tell, mm-hmm. he tells about there are stories of the ladies who went to dinner at Mrs. Mayen's. Okay, see that was simple. You can all you have to do there is go to your, your state historical society, your uh, the really almost the obvious places you would look up big stories, and many people would think that was the end of the story. And very frankly, so far everybody had thought that because they you you could look it up. They they appreciated it. It was great that she did that. And then I got to thinking, okay, here's here's the question, and here's when things change. Yeah, what was she doing here? She's at the end of the Oregon Trail, and she already has a home and a homestead, and she's well enough settled that she has ordered china, and she has a tablecloth and a table. What in the hell is she doing here? Well, that took some research. So uh, at at that point, 
one of the places to start was with the other people who have come to the area. And this is pretty easy to find. You can look. Uh, I do look online a lot. We do not look at Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia. And as with our, um, you know, your your newspaper background, you want three objective sources. But it's pretty easy to find if you go to an area and you are looking at something that changed the area, like the Oregon Trail or the advent of the of the train. Where did people come from? And people who came to the Northwest came on the Beaver, which was if they didn't, if they did, if they came before uh, the Muir train, they came on the little first steamboat that came into Puget Sound. And I look up the passenger list, I look up what happened. Sure enough, Mrs. Mayen was the wife of an enlisted man. Believe me, that life was no easier for an enlisted man then than now. They they were an enlisted couple that came to the Northwest to Fort Stillicum with the Army. And it was hideous. You see, when you when you got to Fort Stillicum, the officers, as usual, had all of the, um, you know, they, they got to live in the, the fort. Um, the enlisted men lived in the barn, of course. What did you think? And the wives didn't live at all, as as, as was cu- customary till very recently. The wives of enlisted men lived where they could find a place to live. So now here is Mrs. Mayen. Remember what uh, the hospitality she's going to offer. She is living across the street from Fort Stillicum, doing laundry. They have, there are a bunch of little cottages, and she is really doing laundry. The rest of the ladies living in the little cottages say they're doing laundry, but they're doing something else. And they are pretty much a, well, they are. What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> See, you've got to keep asking yourself, what do you think? <laughs> and so after a couple of years, the young couple decide, you know, this is not going quite how we like. We thought it might go. And so, well, actually, you probably did think so. But they had, they had come to the Northwest. The reason that many people, most people in that era came to the Northwest because land was available. The Homestead Act. You got to look that up every time anything comes up. You say, "Well, how did this impact them?" So, so the Homestead Act made it possible for a couple to have uh, six hundred and thirty-four acres of land. Wow! And so, um, a single man could have three thirty-two. Um, mm. So naturally, it made sense to be married. And it made sense to have friends. So what they did at the end of three years, or two years, I think, was to decide that they probably had enjoyed the Army long enough. And they w- went together, three couples, and homesteaded north of the Chambers Creek area here in right down the street from my house. I live next to the most important vacant lot in Washington because it's where the first Hudson Bay Company was. So it, I can really see, I can drive down, and often when you're researching, if it's possible, and now on the Internet almost anything is possible, if you will actually go and look at some of these places, you will quickly realize, uh-uh, that didn't happen. It couldn't, even now, you can see, it couldn't have happened that way. So mm. what we know now about, so these three young couples went together, built their home. And now, when the wagon trains come, Mrs. Mayen is there waiting to greet them. Is that a great with, story or what? It is, with her tablecloth with her and ta- her with. table laden with food to nourish them, I'm assuming. Well, right, because she mm-hmm. knew how it was. You know, she, she really did. Mm-hmm. And one more interesting thing, you remember mm. I told you about the tablecloth uh, having strips torn out of it. And it, that one was hard to find out. I, and a lot of times when you find your basic story and you're doing other things because your excellent advice to write, even, see, just what you said, you will never complete the research. It can't be done. I'm still finding out things about Mrs. Mayen. She's buried on the golf course out here. They there you go. Well, but but I love it. I love, here, here the, the thing goes back to here these three couples got together and zap created the seeding of over a thousand acres of prime yeah. 
property. And and see, you could do that. And, yeah, I love and, it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah. And, and as I say now, uh, she's on the golf course. And when they buried her there, <laughs> where she was dead. But it wasn't, it wasn't a golf course then. So now, when you go out to Oakbrook to play golf, you look at the uh, little brochure that comes with the golf course says, you know, as you go to, I think it's the third hole, I'm not sure which one, you'll see. Over to over to the left, there's a monument for Elizabeth Mayen because oh, they fun. built the golf course literally around her. So yeah. the the one other thing was the strips of, from the tablecloth, and it took me a while to find that out. How do you think? What do you think? How did they? How did the strips get torn out of the tablecloth? I, I have no idea, but Good. it's a fact. You're going to tell us. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you this. If you had my book, you'd know. And. <laughs> Anyway, the mountain men who would occasionally come and have dinner, and she apparently, as was very common in those days, everybody uh, who came was welcome. You know, you didn't turn anyone away. So she would frequently have these uh, these mountain men, the fellows who were hunters and trappers, and they would come in with their guns. And here is this lovely tablecloth. It's cotton and it's white. And do you know... If you tore a strip off it, it would be the best thing for cleaning your gun. Oh! <laughs> and, and they did. All right. And you can see, you can, you can actually see that they, I imagine she didn't encourage it. <laughs> no, I would not. The tablecloth's going to disappear pretty quick. All right. Right. So. But, but, you know, we, and, and it took a long time. And that one, I kind of came upon by accident um, talking to, Luckily, when you do that kind of research, sometimes you're lucky enough to find um, descendants and things. And, of course, here living mm-hmm. in the Northwest, that gives me a little edge because there are still people mm-hmm. um, here. And, and now remember that uh, relatives don't always tell you the truth either, but at least you've got something to go on. It's so, a start. So the All big right. thing is, so. yeah, ask questions. Um, remember that you never have come to the end of the story yet as a writer at some point you got to put the thing together and move on so maybe and put, and you put start it yeah. with what you have and uh, just like and I, and I think being in broadcasting for so long has made this part easier because even if I turn up a new fact just before I put the whole book together never mind okay it's, Dorothy it's, hold, hold that Hold that statement. We've got to go to another break and we'll come right back. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Discover the power of you and your book at the Judith Bryles Unplugged events. Each summer, Judith Bryles Book Marketing Unplugged unfolds over three intensive days working with just Judith. You get publishing strategies, author and book platforms, book marketing panache and pizzazz, and authoring tools to take you and your book to rock star success. In the fall and winter, Judith Bryles Speaking Unplugged includes Judith as your coach and mentor during two powerful days. You will learn how to structure a speech, how to create openings and closings, how to find gigs that pay you and sell your books, and you will get one-on-one coaching. Go to thebookshepherd.com and click on the Events tab to learn how to participate at the next Unplugged Workshop event. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, we're we're back with Dorothy Wilhelm. And we're really talking about the basics of research. And as she reiterated in our first two segments, the masterful storytelling that she got into and the unusual off-the-wall facts that people didn't know that they were facts. 
And so how you do, I think what both of us agree that sometimes you never know when you have all the facts. You never know when you have all the facts, but you've got to start down the trail to find out what Paul Harvey used to say, <laughs> what's the rest of the story, which uh, that was one of my favorite segments I always love to listen to. Dorothy, you've, you've created um, kind of when you're going down your trail looking for what's the rest of the story, you have several questions you always ask. What are they? Well, in the first place, of course, basically, what? Exactly. Am I looking for what is the fact? What do I have right now that I know to be a fact that I can build on? And the second question, equally obvious but seldom asked, is what? Well, what am I trying to prove this time? When will I be able to stop for this article or this story or this, you know, presentation, whatever it is? How will I know when I've got what I need? And often that's difficult. Uh, it's, it's difficult to know, and that could change. But at least it gives you a place to start. And mm-hmm. then you've got to jot down a little list of, well, where do I start? Where am I likely to find these answers? Um, and it can be it, the, the obvious places are often good places to start. Even the despised Wikipedia if you don't read the article they wrote. But if you read the, if you go down below and look at some of the source material, you can often find something that is um, worth pulling on. Historical societies, which I have pretty much defamed, nevertheless can be very useful um, to start with. But always think of when you're starting that you are just literally looking for leads. This is this is your own version of the front page. You are now just looking for leads. Um, newspapers.com is great. You, any place that you can actually find something about the era you're, you're trying to research, naturally, if you've got actual people's names and actual dates, then that's terrific. But you don't always have that. And you sometimes have to dig even just into an era. Uh, mm-hmm. So so we get our fact where what are we looking for? Uh, perhaps we're looking for, let's do something obvious. Pretend we are looking for how Abraham Lincoln put together the Homestead Act and why he did. Oh, well, an obvious place to look, of course, is going to be uh, the Homestead Laws, who, who, home, who homesteads were ceded to in the area that you're looking for and that kind of thing. So you get a little good sense and you don't go, you certainly can go to encyclopedias, you can go to the obvious sources, but realize that all that is, is a starting point. You never, never, unless unless it's something you really don't want people to know, um, mm-hmm. there's no point in stopping there. Then mm-hmm. when you have, you've gotten your next leads, you've said, well, how did this happen? Here I found some nice articles. Then, who says so? Who says this is true, and how do I know this is credible? Again, you've got to have three sources, three independent sources, three people who didn't live in the same house. It's just really important that you get something that agrees from a lot of people, in, or three, in, in different areas. And then when did they say it? That is, sometimes you find that people from our era remember things that didn't happen. So you've got to be sure that you keep constantly correcting. And I do find the um, the newspapers of each era to be extremely helpful. When I get a good local story, like Mrs. Mayen's tablecloth, remember, um, it, you, you would certainly look at the newspapers of the day but every once in a while, you find something that you had a national story for. It's worth checking the national news to see if your story comes up there or if uh, at least to find out what else was going on at the time will mm-hmm. provide you with some tantalizing areas to research from. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, you know, let, let, is, me, let me interject here. There's one thing that I always right. tell people that you certainly take advantage of Google Analytics and get your name, your storylines, your book, but also whatever your research topic 
and you put that into quotes so you get alerted right away and come back. The other one, yeah. and I don't know if you know about this one, but it's one of my fave, is that Talk Walker, Talk, like T-A-L-K, Walker.com, do the same thing. I have found them to be more responsive online than Google. Just saying. I did not know about that. and I. Well, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. I try it. I see I do it the old-fashioned way, you know. <laughs> but what's, well, well, since this has come up, tell me a little more about that. I will interview you now, Judith. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't remember when I stumbled across Talk Walker, but I've been recommending it for years um, to authors and um, in 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 the classes that I teach and workshops I do. But it it just is a great resource. It's a certainly freebie. I love freebies. Oh, yes. um, and it's like having your own personal clipping service. You remember the clipping services, Dorothy? Uh, um, of course I do. <laughs> yeah, and the clipping, and having a clipping service. And we've just found that, I mean, daily, I'm telling all of you, daily, I get something that has my name on it or one of my books via them that I have just put in that be on a research. And the reason why I'm telling you all to put quote marks Otherwise, you know, Judith Bryles, if I just put uh, Bryles, you know, there are lots of Bryles out there. Right. I just want something with my name, Judith Bryles. So it's quote, Judith space Bryles, quote, and it comes across. Otherwise, if you have a book that's called How to Survive Disasters, if you don't put that in quote, you will get every alert with disasters, survive, and you'll, you will go cuckoo. So be very careful here. What I tend to get a lot when I put in Dorothy Wilhelm is uh, at my place in life, there's a lot of funerals going on all over the <laughs> world. <laughs> well, how, really, but how, but, how, many, how many Dorothy Wilhelms are there? There, you wouldn't believe how many. And what's really funny, there is now there is one who is a. It's, generally speaking, it's no problem. I'm the one, you know, that comes up because I've been around, kid. But mm -hmm. there is a doctor in. I think she's she's in the Midwest somewhere, and apparently she's very good. She's published a lot, and she is a geriatrician. Therefore, mm. she, it would be obvious to do something together. <laughs> But yes. Well, there you so go. Hard. But I so, okay. So let's talk about. Let me just expand this so we can jump on because I don't want to sure. run out of time. But if you, Dorothy is known as a journalist. Is that safe to say, Dorothy? That is very safe. Okay. If you had an obituary, wouldn't that include that journalism in that uh, lead? You know what? You may have a future in this business. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Yes, that, I'm sorry that I I overlooked that. Yes, you you want to go exactly go through the names and and especially if you are res researching not contemporary but contemporary even so can help. Is that if the person's dead, they're going to say a lot of things about him. Now, eighty percent is going to be lies, but never mind. The point is that yes, you can get a lot of information. You can get a lot of information from pretend it is a a contemporary book or or a historical book from a lot of the city records at that time. Or sometimes, you know, you won't even expect anything, but there it will be. Uh, I recently found a patent for my Aunt Rose, uh, who apparently invented Yeah, you mentioned that. You have told yes. me that story. It's a great story. I, well, I know, but they haven't heard it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, the, but my point is that um, you, you, it takes, it can take you in a totally different direction. Now, if you don't want to be taken in a totally different direction, that's a little bit difficult. But I was recently contacted, in fact, by a historical society in Oregon that wanted to tell the story of my Uncle Lou, who was uh, called the Singing Sheriff, of course. And uh, they had done all of their research through the historical society there in Oregon. Uh, Everything, practically everything was wrong. There was almost not, so you, you just have got to remember that you can't, the, these, especially these, these spurs that come up like the, the obituaries and all, excellent corroboration. You cannot just depend on the one thing that you might find. And even when you think that 
well, it isn't that important. I'll pop it in. Nobody will notice. Oh, count on it. Somebody will notice. Uh, or someone will know the rest of the story. Um, yes, or and, enough of it yeah. enough of it to threaten you with a lawsuit. This is what I have found. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Dorothy, we have we have like two minutes to the next segment. And then when we open up our final segment, we will tell the story about Aunt Rose. We don't, yeah, well, sure, but, sure, sure. But, but can you kiss on lawsuits very quickly? How do we avoid embarrassments in lawsuits? Well, luckily, uh, I have a son who's a lawyer. That helps right away. But mm -hmm. uh, what, what you have to do is, uh, this is the case where your research, seriously, is so important for you to keep in a journal or somewhere um, your trail. This is what I found. What I what I printed is absolutely true because it's based on this resource, this resource, and this resource. And that, I find, is not often done. And it's critical because even months or years after your book comes out, somebody is going to come along and say, as somebody did to me only the other day, first time for this mm -hmm. book, would mm -hmm. it help you to know about an error I found on page 118? I oh, said, no, oh, I know it. I love that. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> but the point is, that, and, and that, but that was the first one. I was very proud. But anyway, but the point is, you never know what's going to strike someone or what you can't know. Because like we said, see paragraph one, we can't know all the facts. Therefore, if you keep that journal, um, and it could be, it can be pretty relaxed. I know you're already doing so much, but. If you know where, and then it'll help you if you have to go back and re-research, too. Because sometimes you do. Sometimes you have to go back and say, wait a minute, I thought it said this, but now it looks yes. like it was something different. It, it, exactly. We're getting ready for our final segment. So when we come back, we're going to talk about some quick sources for you to know about and reliable sources. But just let me do it a share. I had some encounter, just what, the, that page 118? I had yeah. someone encounter an entire research product, an entire book, an entire book. It was a lady's home journal, one of the seven sisters of publishing. Right. And 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 they they said, you know, basically all my research was BS on about why women undermine other women. I said, you know, why did you do your own survey? I'll turn over I'll turn over all my records. I'll turn over all my surveys. To their credit, they did of their entire readership. Eight months later, they announced back, and they did it with a press release that their study totally paralleled mine oh, and it was excellent. in the USA Today. I was thrilled with that. Thrilled and with that. All right, with that, been. we're going to take our final break. Um, okay. And with us is Dorothy Wilhelm. We're talking about research. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Are you confused about publishing options? Do you know which printing option is best for your book? Does your stomach flip when you think about selling books? Or do you feel overwhelmed with what to do about book marketing and publicity? Get the answers and much more. Get them and from someone who knows publishing inside and out from both the traditional and independent sides how to make a successful book. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so. Or you can create a book that looks and feels classy build your brand and platform and is a success a bestseller it is your choice you choose if you want author and publishing success you want Judith Bryles as your book coach sign up for her weekly blogs and easing at the bookshepherd.com The book shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and guide to collaborate with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You do not need more problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Riles will shepherd you through the maze and chaos 
At times, she has had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher, by a publishing service provider, and sometimes even by the author. If you want author and book success, connect with her today at thebookshepherd.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book. If you want to be successful as an author. Your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. With me is Dorothy Wilbham, and we're talking about research, and one of the things that she shared long ago when I first met her, and Dorothy and I have been acquaintances for 40 years, was this wild, off-the-wall story about her Aunt Rose. Now, I work with, as a book shepherd, I work with clients, a lot of them doing, um, you know, their memoirs, family histories, and all that. And I think Dorothy will be the first one to say that what families say are not always the truth. They're not <laughs> always the truth. Um, and this going back to um, the legacy, legendary Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. So the rest of the story, dealing with her, her fabulous Aunt Rose, who would not be an Einstein recipient, she is not an Einstein recipient. It actually it is a, it okay, is go. one that this is one that I got totally out of the blue. It came off the internet, came off of uh, newspapers dot com that my aunt Rose had patented the bathtub mat with the suction cups in it. That, um, as the newspaper story said, is in all the hotels now, which was you know fun, and I could hardly believe my aunt Rose would have done such a thing. <laughs> she, didn't very, yeah. she wasn't very bright. <coughs> so the thing the thing was it turned out that as you looked things up, as you looked up the story, she didn't invent the bath uh, the bath mat. My uncle Ben, her husband did, but he worked for the railroad and if he had if he had taken out a patent, the railroad would have taken it. Just as Sears took the craftsman patent. So mm-hmm. by giving it to his beloved wife and saying that she invented it, he kept it. And that is why all of his sons have a stale in Australia and ours don't. So that's <laughs> <up>. <laughs> But the rest of the story is, yeah. see, we that one literally dropped out of the blue. It's just kind of what we were talking about. Um, I guess I rely on newspapers.com for a spur a lot more than I should. Uh, but I also, just in case there is an area, many authors um, write about an area. For instance, with me, it's more likely to be the Pacific Northwest. So I do take a number of local papers. And as a journalist broadcaster, yeah, i got to admit, I rely on newspapers a lot more than probably many researchers would because I know not only do I know how to use them I know how they're constructed and I know where to look for contact but in addition um, now the quick sources idea I've got to kind of genuflect to uh, to you and admit that I think you've got uh, you've got me all beat on the very quick ones I'm still working on the talk walker thing what <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so embarrassed <laughs> <That's> so... <laughs> I, I love it when I could do a circle around someone who's an old pro. <laughs> so, but but as as places where uh, you would find quickly, I guess you know. Here is a funny thing. I guess I don't expect to find it quickly. I guess I expect that I'm going to be going back and forth. And this is old journalism. There's no question that I have probably not picked up on the um, the 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 quick the quick things as much as I might have. Uh, certainly, I mean, you know, you can start out with encyclopedias and all that. Well, nobody does that anymore. At least we we know that. Um, but like, uh, actually, I like History Link a lot if it is a historical uh, story. 
I don't know if you know that one, his, historylink.com, that's pretty good. But it won't do it. It, it won't do the same thing for you. The Ladies' Home Journal will, though. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 oh my gosh, the historylink.com. You said yes, his, historylink.com. That one's all pretty right. good. All right, all right. Um, let's see. Um, I, I'm I am so kind of beside myself this morning, and the two of us are having trouble fitting into this chair. But um, it, I, I had not realized how much until we started talking, as I said, that I really rely, rely on uh, on the newspapers and on the state historic, not the historical societies, but the historical libraries. Because, I, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, our Washington State uh, Library has is just ec an excellent source. I suppose I have a prejudice against a lot of the quick response things because of the fact that I fear they won't be accurate. And I, I like to give myself the best advantage by starting with, you know, what is at least supposedly uh, accurate information. And I, and that's, I don't admit that's a prejudice. But, mm -hmm. oh, well, there you are. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, I, I think that, um, I mean, we do go online very quickly. I do. I'm online and then I'm starting to funnel out. And I shared with Dorothy during the break that, you know, one of my children um, has been a, a naysayer with COVID. Now, I can't tell you how many times she's had colds and all those other things but um and and she's had covid several times all, as well but but covid doesn't exist in her mind yeah. and a million people dying doesn't exist that it, that she's and she'll say to me mom you just need to look at the metrics so i said so who are you quoting and she gave me the name of this guy and i went into it my god he's been kicked off of so many boards for irrelevant erroneous information and all those things and you, you know, wonder, so how do you keep deep diving down into these things, Dorothy? I mean, don't you come across this? How, where oh, do you do that deep dive? Absolutely. And, and uh, I, I think the thing is, the, the frustrating thing about those metrics that you're talking about is they've yeah. done the deep dive. It isn't as if these people that are putting out the uh, reputations, they will have dug down and found out some little thing that was done in the past, and an author might do the same thing with their with their book. Um, it's up to you, unfortunately, to go back and look up that person, look up the same thing. Now, if that's what it is, either for your character or for just these people that we're hearing about, over and over and over again, what we hear are outright lies or at least stretches of the truth so much that it's bound to bounce back any minute. Um, but comparatively easy really quite 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 much easier than uh when you're building a story when you're building a story you've got to start from the bottom and build up when you are trying to disprove to disprove a story you know disproving is always easier so you need only go to their biographies they all have biographies and look at what the biography is written in if they are purported to be doctors it's pretty easy to look up mm -hmm. their background and their biography mm -hmm. and all that. But yes, trust no one, not even yourself. And you know, it's like, look at the man behind the curtain in um, The Wizard of Oz. You you want to no. be sure? There's many of them. They're duplicating. They're breeding. Yes. Oh, and there will be more and more. Sometimes I'm downright scared because... Um, it's too easy, as you say. You know, you and I, we're online all the time, but we're nice people. Um, we, <laughs> you know, yes. um, and the truth, I, I will knock myself out to be sure that everything I put out is true. So will you. Well, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that don't look at it that way. And I believe that's a good note to, you know, maybe to end on is to realize that for everybody today, the truth in researching has become far less important in many ways. It really doesn't matter. What matters is hearing the story you want to hear. The best we can do in my show um, last week, one of the things we put out was research on how you get your word to your, your the, what you want to your state representative or, and your 
national senate and representatives what are the actual numbers what are what you can actually do um those are the kinds of things that are surprisingly easy to find and are completely discounted with these mm -hmm. metrics that are going on and mm -hmm. and i find that terrifying well, here's the other thing is that um, I, I am actually someone, my husband, John, says, I can't believe that you have whipped off, a, a, you know, a a letter, a note that a lot of people don't realize that that I don't know if it's a, a written rule or an unwritten rule. I'm thinking it's probably written that they have to journal note in um, when constituents and things call and email yeah. or write letters. OK, so. I, here's what I'm going to tell all of you. If 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 you're an advocate, um, if an activist, if you have concerns, you better bloody well know who your senators and your Congress people are, and key people in Congress, yeah. and you should know their Twitter handles. You should know how to. I communicate all the time by using this ways, and that you know I feel I'm doing my bit. The question is, are you doing your bit? You know, we've had the. Gun thing is a concern for me in a variety of different ways. Uh, the children I adore. Women's health care is very important for me. So I'm active on that. My and question is gonna, for all and, of and you, question, are you? The question's got to be, though, Judith, is our researchers in the future going to look, look back and find that we did nothing? Well, I, I, they can't count me in that point because I, 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 I am there. You know, when I when I get on Twitter, sometimes I have people blowing, you know, like a little spark club glide his head, a gift that goes up when I am really upset. And I'm, by the way, I'm talking about when I have to reach Amazon and I am unsuccessful or any of the other sources. I go to Twitter and guess what? I often get a phone call within a half an hour to help me resolve my problem. So That's excellent, under, Anastasia. understand the power of, of, of tagging, of handles, yep. and hashtags. Just understand that. All right, Dorothy, we're in quite wrap-up. I, I have got to thank you. Thank yes. you for being with me for this hour. I look forward to doing another hour where we're going to play around a little bit with humor. Yes, we're going to have a wonderful time. And I've got to say you're welcome. It was a joy to be with you. <laughs> Um, it was a joy. I got nowhere to go with that. It was a joy to be with you. Thank you. And I want to mention to all, you can also catch Dorothy on, oh, God, you're ready for all of this, the Spunky Old Broads Network. And she has her own show. Um, she's there. Um, and I would just go after and have a good time with it on <laughs> on all of that. And as oh, a member of the Spunky Old Broads, we celebrate the month of March every, or, or February, everyone. It's the National Spunky Old Broads Month. We're way past <laughs> it. But for those of you who are listening in who consider yourself an SOB, you might want to remember that. All right, Dorothy, thank you for being with us. Thank you for all of us for listening in. We will be back with you next week with another great show to enhance your book publication. Yeah.